Right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, my name's uh, Chris Moore. I'm the uh, founder of the PCBSD project, and today I'm going to be giving a talk about uh, making FreeBSD on the desktop a reality. First, what we're going to do is take a look at some of the pros and cons of using FreeBSD on the desktop. If anyone's tried it, some of these may be familiar with you, but uh, we're going to go ahead and go through them anyway just to bring people up to speed. First of all, we're going to look at the strengths. Now, obviously, as most of you know who run FreeBSD, we're looking at rock solid stability, security, and speed. I mean, that's a huge selling point for not only a server, but a desktop user. A lot of things that apply on the server are going to apply very well on the desktop as well. Another thing is a large availability of ported software. I don't know what the last count was of the ports tree, but 12,000 around there available for, for FreeBSD. Other things that we offer is 3D acceleration and sound support. You know, FreeBSD, if people think of console, server, they don't assume that, oh, hey, we can play sound, we can do 3D video, games. I mean, it's, it's all there. So again, another plus for FreeBSD on the desktop market. Wireless support as well. So I'm running it right here on my laptop. You know, wireless is a plus for the desktop. And uh, of course, for people coming over from Windows, this is what I like to tell them, resistance to viruses. It's uh, definitely better implemented with more security and user levels and layers, which can uh, protect you against viruses and other malware that might be common on a Windows desktop. However, with those pluses, there are also some negatives with FreeBSD, the vanilla version as it stands right now. We'll take a look at some of those. First of all, is the lack of an easy to use graphical installer. That's the very first thing a desktop user will notice and identify as a problem when they first boot it up to try and install FreeBSD. No doubt many of you guys have installed it, you're used to it, it's great, but give it to your mother-in-law or your father and have them boot up to that uh, system install and see what happens. <laughs> so, another thing which is a big deal in the desktop world is pretty much a non-existent XORG configuration tool. I mean, we do support XORG through ports, but there's no tools which allow you to configure it aside from running some uh, command line options, which again, you have to have a pretty decent knowledge of how XORG works in order to manipulate them. Another thing will be a difficult network setup. Again, if you're a power user, sure, yeah, go edit, edit uh, etcrc.com for your WPA supplicant. That's fine. But for your desktop user, they don't have a clue what any of that is I just said, and they're stuck trying to figure out how do I get on the net and just you know, surf, the, surf the web. Another thing is the difficult online updates for a desktop. You know, if you know how to build world, build your kernels, great, you know, you're in good shape. But a desktop user, all they want to do is click OK, it'll restart, and they're up to date. Again, FreeBSD doesn't excel as much in that area. And then manual package management would have to be the last one. Again, we have a ton of software. Ports is great, but how does a user utilize them? We don't have a lot of graphical front ends to that. And unless they like compiling source or manipulating the package add command, it can get a little bit hairy for a mom or pop or just somebody who's not a, a Unix expert. Now we're going to take a look at how we're trying to address and fix these weaknesses or create a complete desktop package. Uh, with FreeBSD. First thing we're trying to do is improve the user installation experience and problem one which I identified already is Sysinstall. Again, a great tool. I don't want to knock it if any of the developers from Sysinstall are here, but it, you know, it is beginning to look a little bit dated. Let's go ahead and take a look here. The first thing I've gotten from people when I show them this is, what is this, some DOS program? You know, how do I use this? Again, coming from the perspective of a desktop user who doesn't understand Unix or Linux, and this may be their first experience touching open source. You know, it's not intuitive for the most part. Again, they're looking for point and click. Where do I click next and just say, here's my disk, install. There's a little more uh, to do with sysinstall to get that far. You know, partitioning is a little more difficult, network setup, um, etc. They just assume it's going to auto detect, set everything up. Well, all I do is tell it where's my C drive or my disk drive, go ahead and install the system for me. They don't want all the partition options. How do I set up user partitions? That's confusing to your average desktop user. And here's the solution we've come up with in the PCBSD project is uh, our own installer called PC Install, which is graphical based, again, very intuitive. And if you take a look here, I mean, it's very simple right up front. We support multiple languages, which is great. So if you're installing in Japanese, for example, you can just select it up there. And all your characters will come up in Japanese, and it'll walk you through the installation. You can set up your keyboard options right here, which will go ahead and uh, let you adjust your keyboard layout. And again, if you're not using a standard 104 key English keyboard, time zones, etc. Right on the first screen with quick and helpful tips at the bottom, which again makes it pretty painless for a desktop user who's 
usually a little more proficient, but still has never done a, a Unix or Linux install. This is a, a good way for them to get their feet wet. First thing that somebody notices when they boot this up is it looks like a modern desktop install. You know, we boot right up to a GUI, very comfortable, my mouse works, everybody's happy. That's what people are looking for when they, when they bring up the desktop. The intuitive interface, again, tips, tools, it's very simple basically, it takes about a minute to go through, you hit next a couple times, just you can take the defaults for the most part and it does all the work for you. And I've mentioned the tips as well, which help guide the user in case they do have some questions about what each option does. Those are listed in the bottom there. We've also simplified the disk setup and package selection. Um, we do have options for custom partitioning, which is great, but they are hidden under an advanced menu. So for your average desktop user, they can just select, use my entire disk or install on this partition. It takes it from there and just uh, sets up what we uh, define as a best desktop defaults. And the package selection as well also lets you uh, just select some popular packages like Firefox, Thunderbird, Pigeon, various things they may want to use. The next thing, next problem we have in vanilla FreeBSD is the no XORG setup wizard. If you boot FreeBSD for the first time, this is your XORG setup wizard. You get dropped to this prompt, and if you're a desktop user, you are clueless at this point, and usually calling whoever your tech support person is to figure out, okay, that's great, how do I get a mouse, how do I get a desktop, this doesn't look like the internet to me. So uh, that's the first pro another problem we're trying to fix through PCBSD. And we've done this through developing our own tool called the XORG setup GUI. You know, I know not very imaginative names, there's nothing flashier, but it just works and that's all that matters. Again, very simple options for a user, most of them will understand. I have resolutions, uh, color depth, and then you can pick your driver. This was a sample that normally it, uh, gives you a monitor and video card info up there as well. So if some user doesn't know what they're even running, they'll get that. Yes? Do people understand what things like color depth mean? Most, most of the time they don't, so they just leave it as the default. Again, we default to 24 bits, so we, we just tell them hit apply, just change. Usually the only thing people touch in here is the uh, screen resolution. Most users get a pretty good feel what that is because then it, when you hit apply, it actually lets you test it and see if you like this resolution or if you want to go bigger or smaller. I'm imagining my mother doing this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, again, if you find ways or if you run into little hiccups like that, it's good to give me suggestions on how we can even make it simpler. I mean, we could throw color depth under advance, but you know, it's still a pretty basic option, so we like to well, keep I'd it right front. Yeah, the video driver, now we do auto detect that. So for example, it's showing NV right now because I'm installing on an NVIDIA system. So it'll default to that. Now if you're a little more advanced user, we have the binary NVIDIA drivers. You just click down and it gives you the option to switch between the two. That's, yeah. Given the auto detect, that's all the more reason to hide it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then uh, of course all the other drivers listed there too. If, if again you're a little more advanced user, you can use Visa mode, etc. We have an advanced tab there. I don't think I have a screenshot of it. But under the advanced tab, we have options for dual head. So again, if you're a, a dual head user, I know that can be a nightmare to set up in XORG. We make it very simple. Basically, it's one checkbox. Enable dual head. What resolution do I want on my second monitor? It basically does all the massaging, figures out what driver you got, and then sets up your uh, XORG.conf with those options. And under advanced, we also offer uh, refresh rate options for your monitor. We try and let XORG auto detect those, which works 90% of the time, maybe, 85. I mean, it's not foolproof. XORG's not perfect at that. So if somebody needs to, they can still go enter their, their manual refresh rates. And we pretty much went through most of this here, but basically allows somebody to configure their display via point and click, which they want. It runs by default in 1024 by 768 with all the auto-detected driver uh, refresh settings. And a lot of users, if they don't know what they're doing, just click skip on this wizard because they're happy, they like what they see on the screen. Good enough for me, so they just skip and go right into the desktop and it supports some fail-safe modes. We actually do quite a few checks when you boot up for the first time. It detects if it can even start XORG, do we have an auto-detected configuration that works. If it fails, it'll fall back to a few different modes until it hits basically the most generic Visa 60 hertz refresh rate mode there is, and that works usually in every case. It's very rare that I find a, a system where we can't get that up and running. Next problem we're looking at for a desktop user is networking setup. Now, many of you probably recognize what this is. This is your wireless setup and traditional FreeBSD, which again to the home user, uh, that's pretty complicated. Uh, take your average Windows user and tell them, yeah, go, uh, go into Pico or VI and set that up, you know, and then have fun. <laughs> so <laughs> we're trying to solve this problem. And we've come up with our own network device manager to help. Basically in PCBSD, uh, we auto detect all your NICs and uh, wireless devices and we just set them to DHCP by default and they're right on your tray. 
when you double click them, we bring up a tool that lists, okay, here's your cards. It shows if they're active or not. The little, uh, you know, the circle in the corner means it's not plugged in, so no active connection. And if you double click it, you can, uh, let me see if I have a picture, you can bring up additional settings. So if it's a wireless device, we have a Wi-Fi setup and an Ethernet setup. The Wi-Fi setup is very simple and intuitive. Just point and click and say, scan for my SSID, enter my password, and get me on the net. And it does all the, the FreeBSD backend configuration itself, sets up WPA supplicant, restarts the network device if it needs to. Just makes it uh, easy for the user to use. But again, it's a graphical, so very uh, simple point and click. And most of the time, if you're setting this up for somebody, it's a one-time deal. You just set up their network and set it and leave it and forget it, and it just works from there. Supports the Wi-Fi scanning and various encryption methods for Wi-Fi, which is important on uh, laptops. Another cool thing we have is a tray application, which is a separate app we've written that just monitors and sits in your tray, just like on a, a Windows or Mac desktop, and just tells you, okay, here's my Wi-Fi, here's what strength I have, you know, what's my IP, my MAC address, lets the user know what's going on. Okay, so we've taken a look at some of the problems that I wanted to address today, but now we're going to look at some of the system modifications we're making to FreeBSD itself to make it a desktop. Again, we're not a fork, so we're not changing a whole lot, but I do want to point out some of the things we're doing. We use a little bigger uh, conf kernel configuration than generic just to include some extra drivers out of box, some of the Wi-Fi cards and firmware and stuff so it works without a user having to do a kernel recompile. We also include a lot of packages in the base system, which again, FreeBSD starts with no packages unless you select them. We default to having X11, KDE4, NVIDIA drivers, Flash 9, right out of the box. Again, most things the desktop user is going to need to, to get going in a few minutes. This is something new, which I wanted to touch on here a little bit today. Um, we use a custom local base now, starting in the new version of PCBSD. We're not defaulting to user local. I'm going to touch on that in a little bit here, but this is going to open up some new, uh, new interesting avenues for us. And we're going to look at the last problem here is uh, our packaging system for software. I mentioned before, FreeBSD has a ton of ports, but what use of it is to a user if they can't get them installed? If they don't understand make install, or they don't know what it means to wait and compile, or figure out package add, then what's the point? So we're trying to, to make the package manager a little more friendly here. So let me look through some of the, the strengths and weaknesses of ports. Again, a ton of available applications. Just about any open source app you want will be in the ports tree, and if it's not, somebody's probably working on it to get it in right now. It's up to date pretty, pretty currently with uh, most popular releases of open source packages like Firefox, Thunderbird. Here's a downside though, long wait times for builds. Again, uh, if you run FreeBSD on a desktop and ever need to use OpenOffice, you know the pain involved with uh, compiling something like that. Or even Firefox can take four or five hours on a more modest system. Tedious upgrade process. process. Uh, port upgrade's cool. Again, if you're a power user, very neat. But for a desktop user, that can be pretty hairy, trying to go through and figure out what dependencies need to be updated, which ones need to be rebuilt. Might take a day to do it, I mean, depending on how big your package tree is. Another thing is it's prone to dependency-related failures. This is a problem desktop users don't understand. When, I, when they want to install a package, they don't care what dependencies it needs. All they assume is, I want Firefox. Firefox should work. I don't care about GTK. I don't care about Pango. I don't even know what those are half the time. It should just work when I click the icon. And the port tree still is prone to those kind of failures. Not as often. It does a good job. But when it happens, it's, again, a, a huge roadblock for a desktop user to get fixed. Another thing is a lot of packages won't contain desktop icon data. When make install finishes, if the user gets that far, you're just kind of stuck at the command prompt going, okay, what just got installed? Where's my, uh, what command do I run? Where's my icons? What's all the different flags? So that's another uh, downside. Now for the packages, we solve the problem of no compile times. It's pre-compiled, so you just package add. Again, though, tedious upgrade process. So if you're upgrading your port street port upgrade, again, you're looking at dependency issues and possible failures. There's no GUI-driven installation method on FreeBSD by default. There may be some in ports, but again, that's something the user has to go add first. And it may not contain desktop icon data. Some programs do, not all. Now, this is something we've done called PBI Push Button Installer for PCBSD, which is designed to address some of these. So here's some of the strengths and weaknesses of it. Again, no long compile times. It's a static binary package, so just download and uh, ready to go. It's very simple to upgrade because our packages work a little differently with all their dependencies and libraries included within the PBI. You're not stuck uh, having issues doing upgrades of various libraries that are required by your new package. They're, they're in there. You basically remove a directory and add the new version. You're ready to go. 
again, includes all the necessary libraries. And we also have a GUI and command line interface for the PBI system. So for the average user, let me see here. Oh, a downside is low, a larger total installation size. Obviously, if you have a PBI of Firefox, which includes Pango, GTK, all the libraries, you will have some extra megabytes. But for this day and age, most users don't care. They just want it to work. They don't mind if it's an extra five megs bigger than, uh, than the port may have been. Now we're going to look at some of the differences here in how we do libraries. Uh, do we depend or do we not depend? That's really the question here. This is a model of a standard package management under FreeBSD or Linux. What you see here is you have your base system, and then you have your packages sitting on top of your base system. And if you notice, there's a lot of lines connected there. A lot of things depend on one another. Package F needs C, it needs B in order to function. But J needs F, which requires the ones underneath it to function as well. That's your typical model. And of course, this is very simplified. You may have 10,000 of these with little connections and dependencies everywhere. This is what we've done on PCBSD with the PBI model. We have given you your base system, which is FreeBSD, of course. And then we have PBIs. And if you notice, they are self-contained now. All they rely on is the base system. You know, just some generic libraries like libc, basically. Very standard stuff, which doesn't change that often. But the packages are now self-contained. All the libraries are inside, and they're not touching each other. Firefox is not depending on uh, other libraries from Thunderbird, for example. They both include their right versions. And the desktop also is separate. This would be KDE, Xorg. These are not, you know, don't touch your PBIs as well. So they're independent of your desktop updates. We can roll out an update to Xorg, for example, or an update to KDE or Qt, and it won't break your PBI packages. It's not going to affect them in that way where all of a sudden they're looking at libraries that don't work or aren't there anymore. In practice, this is how we do it. Building the PBI package, First of all, applications are compiled from ports, so we're essentially piggybacking off the ports tree in order to build these packages, which saves us a little bit of work since most of you guys have done the work porting it to FreeBSD in the first place. This is how we build a PBI file. We're just sending custom local bases. This is one way we create them self-contained. So when we build Firefox, we set local base to programs, Firefox, whatever the version is, and then all the libraries are now linked with that uh, path in their libraries so they can find each other and not look into user local or, or whatever base we're using. When it's finished, we just uh, compress all the data with tar and LZMA so we get a good compression ratio. And then we take that uh, compressed data and we append it to a binary, which is our PBI push button installer binary that includes the GUI and the command line. So from the user perspective, it's like downloading an EXE file, for example. It's just executable. You run it. It asks you if you want to install, you know, enter your root password, boom, it extracts the data into the programs directory and you're good to go. This is what a PBI actual structure looks like here. Again, I kind of touched on this. We have the loader binary, which sits at the front of the package. So if you actually do a file on it, it'll show up as a FreeBSD ELF binary. Next, we have a small tarball with just some package details that gets extracted when you run some commands on it. It just checks, okay, here's the name, here's the version, here's the MD5 sum and some uh, hashes to make sure the package archive is, uh, is in, you know, the integrity is good of it at the end there. So when you actually execute it for the first time, it goes through and runs a complete check and warns you if you have a corrupted package before you try and install it. This is what the actual end user sees, though, when they double click it. You know, this is all in the background. The average desktop user don't care about any of the stuff I just told you about. This is what they see. This is what they're happy with. They bring up an application. We have a nice GUI. You know, we can support custom graphics. What's kind of cool is you can even pick where you want to install it now on the system. You, know, you can install apps in your home directory if you like. It tells you how much disk space you have, how much is needed. Hit next a couple times and you're done. That's, uh, again, very painless. If, you're any, if anyone's coming from Windows or Mac, this is not difficult to figure out. And they would be surprised to find out half the time they're running on FreeBSD. But uh, again, the presentation's everything. <laughs> so, so basically, what the point I'm trying to make here is FreeBSD can and does make a great desktop. PCBSD is. FreeBSD. You know, again, we're not a fork. We're not messing with the system too much here. We're just trying to make it easier for the user, just so they can use it as a real desktop, and we can push into that market where Linux has been trying to go and uh, take back some of that market share from them and from the Windows and Mac guys as well. Now, the one thing I, I did want to talk about a little bit for more technical um, that I didn't have in the slides was the local base. Starting in the new release of PCBSD 7.1, which is due up by the end of the month or so, we're switching to a uh, PCBSD slash local base for all of our ports. 
And this is cool for a couple reasons. If you're a FreeBSD user, this will be of interest to you. We've localized everything there so that user local is now empty. When you install PCBSD and go run a package info, it shows no packages installed. I mean, everything's been separated out. Your desktop is now not a part of the traditional port street. This is cool because in the past we were using user local and when you'd run a package info, it would show all of our packages installed, KDE, XORG, whatever. And then you'd go install ports because a lot of guys, you know, they don't want to use a PBI. They know what they're doing. They just want to go run make or add some package, which is great. But the downside was when we ran an online update or issued updates, we couldn't control what ports you'd installed or we couldn't guarantee they wouldn't break when we did online updates. Again, you were basically installing stuff into the desktop. Now what we've done is your desktop separate. You can run the, the FreeBSD port street concurrently with PBIs simultaneously. They don't touch each other. They don't touch the desktop. So you can use it in effect as a normal FreeBSD system again like it's a brand new fresh install. So if you're a ports user, this will be of great interest to you. And yeah, I use it from time to time because sometimes there's a complicated server port or something that we don't have a PBI of and I just want to go make it and do it. So uh, this will let us roll out and issue updates. You don't have to worry about it clobbering your data on user local anymore, which is a big deal. So uh, that's actually why we've been so delayed on this release since FreeBSD 7.1 came out is we're just trying to fine tune, adjust, and get this all working. We actually had to write a, a patch to FreeBSD to make this work. FreeBSD does not play well with multiple local bases, I found out the hard way when we uh, went, went forward with this, involving uh, ldconfig and ldelf.so. Basically what happened is the hints file would be shared between our local base and the regular local base, and uh, John here back in the corner wrote a patch for me which uh, allows us to set an environment variable and use an alternate hints file for the desktop versus your normal ports which is pretty cool. So again, we're keeping them separate because when you run a port make, sometimes it runs ldconfig in the background to check and see what libraries are installed and if it needs to build them. Well, now it's not going to try and see the libraries in the desktop and, and accidentally include them because it assumes the library's there in ldconfig, but then the include files aren't in user local, things like that. It caused a lot of make problems, but now that's completely separate, separated out. And on your desktop, you just have a couple icons that say make ports or run ports, and it just switches you to that local base and you're good to go. So that'll be a new feature we're gonna, we're gonna tout a bit because again, for more advanced users who wanna use the dependencies like building ports or are just, you know, ports developers even will like this because now they can do that on PCBSD without any distraction from what's actually included on the desktop. But uh, that's just something I wanted to touch on a little bit because that's kind of a, what's happening right now with PCBSD. But uh, that's actually pretty much it. I mean, that's what we've done to make the desktop a reality with uh, FreeBSD and uh, yeah, we're growing, and we're doing good, and we're hoping to improve it in the future. The goal is to get to the point where you can throw it on mom or dad's system, they can get on the net, do email, visit Facebook, send pictures, print. Everybody's happy, and you know the world is great, and they're not worried about getting viruses, and, and they have good speed and stability. So uh, again, I think FreeBSD, there's been a lot of misconception here that FreeBSD can't be a desktop. Well, I beg to differ a bit. You know, We have Macintosh OS X, which kind of pulled a little bit there and threw their own GUI on top. Boom, we have a full desktop. Why can't we do the same thing with regular FreeBSD as the base? We don't have to fork it and close source it. We can just uh, push traditional FreeBSD. So uh, that's all I got for you guys this morning. Thank you guys very much for uh, attending. Is there any questions? Yep. How, how many packages do you have in the in your in the PBI app? tree? I think we're at like 350 now. Just the big ones, Firefox and the Thunderbirds, and a lot of the GUI apps. There's a lot of stuff in ports, which are little command line Perl apps and we don't make a lot of packages of those. We're actually, uh, we've doubled that since last year. We're building, we're building more every year. It takes me a while. I can't just automate it and say, here's a port, turn it into a PBI, because there's actually some user thought that has to go into this. What icons do I need? What uh, graphics do we need? Which libraries need to get copied? How, what port options do we need to use to build it? So I'm usually adding a few per week and we have a couple of our developers who add a couple per week and we test them and then throw them up on our website for people to uh, download. And uh, one thing I didn't mention or show here was uh, the PBI update process is super simple. I mean, if you have a desktop user, it just notifies them on the tray, hey, there's a new version of Firefox, do you want to apply it? Yes, no. Double click it, it just removes the old one, throws the new one on, replaces the desktop icons, you're good to go. So again, for a desktop user, very simple. And we hope to get to the point where we have you know, a thousand ports, which I would guess once we get to that point, that'll be the majority of desktop ports because a lot of them are not designed for a graphical interface. And some of them we cheat with, like QEMU is a command line interface. But what we can do in the PBI system is we bundle it with AQEMU, which is the graphical front end to it, which looks kind of like VMware. 
So when the user installs the QEMU PBI, all of a sudden they got a nice icon on their desktop, brings up the GUI. They can use QEMU, create you know, VM environments without uh, knowing any of the command line flags. But QEMU is still there if you want to you know, hack it in a way. <laughs> so, any other questions? Yeah. So by making PBIs self-contained, do you find you're replicating a lot of stuff between packages? Yes. That. So what does that do to your memory footprint? Uh, I don't see a whole lot of difference. Most desktop users only have a few apps open at a time, so I'm not seeing a huge loss of memory, and I've never actually had a complaint from anyone using it saying, oh, we're running out of memory or we're going into swap now. On a modern system where you got 512 or even a gig of RAM, it seems to be fine. Desktop space, or a disk space, yeah, it does use a bit more. If you have Thunderbird and Firefox, they both include GTK or Pango, you know, in both. So granted, you are going to lose a few megs with each package in our system. Again, with, with the hard drives growing as quickly as they are, it's becoming more and more of a non-issue. And for the desktop user, all they care is that it just works. They don't care if it's five megs bigger. I'm actually more concerned about memory, because yeah. it may not seem like a lot that you're stealing from other things. Yeah, you are. You are. And again, this is for desktops. If you're more concerned about memory, you might want to go use the ports tree. And that's why we've added this back in. So if you have those concerns, you're welcome to use traditional ports and packages and not worry about the memory loss. So it would be nice, now I've been told this doesn't work in FreeBSD, I'd love it if somehow it would determine if this library is already in memory, even though it's in a different location on the disk. Say there's an identical match of Pango running between three applications. Well, it would be great if they would just use the same library in memory. Way beyond my knowledge, though. So if somebody wants to hack away at that, go right ahead. We'll be, we'll be happy to use it. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's a little beyond what, uh, what my scope of what I do. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Great. Thank you guys very much. Oh, all right. Do you try to localize the other language? Yes. Yes. Um, we have, a, I don't have Wi-Fi set up at the moment, but uh, on our website we have a translation mailing list and then a, a Poodle web interface where you can go and translate into any languages you want. I think Japanese is even finished right now and there's, uh, I think, 50 languages listed on there that we support at the moment and uh, several of them still need some work. So. If you can help translate, that would be great. But uh, as soon as you do that, it just, when you pick, say, Japanese during the installation, the installer runs in Japanese, and your desktop just comes right up in Japanese. I mean, it looks and works like you would expect it to do on a desktop. So we appreciate as many translations as possible because we actually see this being very popular overseas outside of America where people aren't quite as tied to Microsoft and to Apple. This is very popular. So as many translations as uh, you guys can do or people who speak other languages want to help with, that would be much appreciated. We uh, definitely enjoy having extra ones available. Oh, okay. I could uh, bring it up here. Let's see if I got a jack here somewhere. Yeah, you know, actually, I don't even think there's an Ethernet. Yeah. yeah, you got them, but they don't like the speakers. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can bring up the web here and show you guys, like, the translation interface. For example, it's all web-driven, so it's very easy. So this would be an example of the default desktop, by the way, in case nobody's seen it. This is KDE 421. This is the beta of PCBSD 7.1 we're running here. Yeah, works. Okay. Oh, that's just the KDE thing letting you know the app was loaded in. I think the default is a 30 second a timeout, but we're talking about changing it to like five or something so it doesn't keep How about bouncing. How about that would work too. That would work too. This is our uh, translation interface. Uh, the address is pcbsd.org colon 8080 port 8080. And uh, essentially your languages are listed here. You just pick a language and we upload the strings whenever we have new uh, translations which need to be finished. As you can see, Japanese is just about done. It only has five strings left to be translated, according to this. But there's other languages that are uh, a little farther behind here. Let's see where French is at. I haven't checked it in a while, so I'm not sure where we're at with one of these. Mm. 
But again, uh, you just make a user account. You can register for your own user account on the website, and then you can just start translating, and other people can help. It's all very uh, shared and collaborative effort here. But uh, while that's coming up, let me show you guys an example. This is, for example, PBI files on PCBSD. And another feature, a goodie I didn't mention, was we embed icon data into the PBIs now, and we're the first out of all the open source desktops on Linux or Unix, whatever, which does this. We actually uh, got the KDE guys all excited because we wrote a plugin to support this. But now, even though these are executable files, they show up with all their icon data, data like on a uh, another desktop or other systems would. But here would be an example, QE and U. I want to install. Fine. There it is. We have some custom graphics. One of our guys designs these. And uh, just click next a few times. That's pretty much it. Oh, that's right. I have installed. It's just warning me to get rid of the old one first before you load, load the new one up. If you have dependencies between PBIs, you can move them anywhere you want. How does the new thing know where you put the old one? Oh, uh, we just create a, a sim link back to the programs directory with the name of the app there to wherever you installed it. So it's still able to pull up its libraries at the default path, which works. Let me see here. Do I, I don't think I have views installed. We'll try that one. This is uh, another nifty Java app. There you go. So this is what the user sees. Again, just a couple minutes. And it's done. Actually, this one just be a few seconds. Let's see if this one here... go. Yeah, so French, there's 432 strings that need to be finished. Again, you can use it if all the strings are translated, but you'll see gaps when you're running applications or stuff that just isn't translated yet. It's just a, a fragment of a sentence, or it could be a word. Sometimes it could be punctuation. It just depends on, on the actual app, how it uses those strings. So um, usually they're just small sentences, a couple words a piece. All right, so views, for example, just finished installing. And it's letting me know it's ready to go. And you can tell it to start the application when I click Finish. And there we go. So it comes right up to the user. And this is actually running a Java application, which is pretty cool. Yada, yada. There we go. But again, what we did here, we'll take a look. We made icon data for the desktop. It also threw itself into, I'm trying to think if it went in here or yeah, used it out here. This one is a new one I'm working on. I don't have all the icons on yet. But it just throws it in and you're ready to go. So for example, Firefox, that's a PBI. It just integrates right into the desktop like a regular app should. Let me take a peek here and show you for the curious. I don't know if you can see the color's kind of off here. But... Uh, Here's the actual applications. So we'll just take a look at Firefox, for example. That's a, that's a common one. Here's our data. We just have some scripts which do the actual installation. Um, we, can, we can put stuff in here. For example, Firefox is a, a web browser. It's kind of nice if you can tell it to be the default web browser in your desktop. So our scripts set that up for the user. But the actual data, you know, the libraries are in lib. You know, makes sense. And bin, you got some binaries it needs to run in order to function. Makes sense. But the beautiful thing is it doesn't leave this directory. You have a shared directory for it. So we include, uh, again, you can't see them very well up here, but uh, locale, fix maps, themes, just, just the data it needs. Often we'll find actually some of the PBIs will be smaller than the, port, the equivalent port because what will happen is when you build a port of Firefox, it'll install a gazillion apps, and it only needs 10% of them to run. A lot of them are just there for building. So we can exclude all that, exclude the binaries for GCC or whatever whatever it is it's using for the build, make, and just include the, the relevant running data. So at first it'll look like it's a little smaller, but it is including the libraries and you're not including all the, the other garbage you need just to build. But uh, that's, that's all it is. We have a command line here. Uh, we can just take a look at what's installed. We have a couple a couple interfaces like this, which just let uh, more advanced users navigate around the PBI system. And close this point here. So that's how a PBI works. Um, let me see here. Close that one. 
Here's the Wi-Fi manager. So that's kind of what I showed you in the screenshot here. Set up all your all your encryption and stuff. You know, very very common for a user if you're running a Mac or Windows. You know, you should know most of the stuff to get on the network, or you can ask somebody what's my WP key. But uh, for a desktop user, this is very simple. And here's our online update notifier down here. It's just let me know, hey, your system's up to date. You're good to go. Don't have to worry about it. And that'll change and let you know if uh, something's available for your system. So here's my NICs. Telling me here's what I got. I have an advanced tab. So if you want to get a little more uh, into it and customize your network a bit, you can. PPOE, DNS, all those goodies. IPv6 gateways. I haven't done a lot of IPv6 yet. I don't have a the access at the house, but uh, yeah, one of the tools we've written to again run on top of FreeBSD and make it accessible to a desktop user. Is there anything else somebody would like to see specifically on the system? I'll show you one thing really quick: uh, the the PBI Remove tool. This is checking for updates, and right now it's checking the PBIs to see if there's any available. The delay might be a bit because the servers here in America, but again, here's your list of PBIs. You know, add or move, very simple. And we do some other stuff here. We have optional components, parts of the system that we do not install by default because a lot of users may not want them. The port's free, the source code, you can just add it right here. So if you don't even know how to use Port Snap or uh, CVS, we can take care of that for you. And we have some uh, components of KDE, which not everyone will want, but some people do, so we offer them as options right over here. And then uh, just minimal configuration stuff. You want to use a custom temporary directory for downloads if you've custom partitioned it. So that's pretty much uh, how it works. I mean, at this point, I mean, it boots right up to a desktop. It looks just like this. This is pretty much a de default install I just did here uh, a couple days ago. And uh, the user is able to go from there. We've written our own system tool as well, which shows you what's actually going on under the hood. See, it's running FreeBSD 7.1 stable. Yeah. Information about the hardware, set some kernel options, fetch your source. If you want to get a little more up to date one than the, than the tarball we include, you can run port snap or CVS up right here. And then uh, splash screens for the boot up if you want to use something and not see all the kernel messages. KDE also supports uh, 3D acceleration and stuff now for the desktop, which is really cool. So you get those compiz, vista like effects, and eye candy, which is pretty neat. I don't have it enabled here because uh, I'm not running in my native resolution for the projector, so I can't show that off at the moment. But, uh, Anybody else have any questions? Cool. Well, thank you guys very much for coming and uh, listening. I appreciate it. And uh, any way I can help, please let me know. I'm easily available on the web. So, great. Thank you guys. Still checking for updates. Like I said, it's back in the U.S., so maybe we need to get a server over here in Japan somewhere to make it a little faster. Are you supporting anything other than X86 hardware? AMD64. Yeah. That's those are the only two builds we do. So yeah, I haven't seen you. AMD64 is not for me. Yeah, yeah. The only downside I'll mention about the AMD64 is we are still messing the NVIDIA drivers for it. We have Flash 9 that works on AMD64, so that's cool. But uh, if you want NVIDIA 3D acceleration, come talk to me. We have stuff for you to fix in the kernel. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple things that need to be addressed still. And they, actually, NVIDIA has told us, you know, as soon as you get these, we want to give you this driver because it will run better than on Linux. We're talking SLI support, you know, all the dual head, all the pretty stuff. So they're, they're really eager to push it out. And I think there was a list of five things that need to be addressed. And four of them are done now, I believe. There's just one. Uh, function that needs to be implemented and they'll be able to offer better support than on the Linux side. So if anyone uh, knows a little bit more about kernel development than me and wants to tackle that, go right ahead because that's it's uh, like MMAP functionality. It's a little beyond my my pay grade. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, let me uh, matter of fact you guys may want to bookmark this URL here.
Oh, well, yeah, that's the first one in my list here. This is it right here. What's needed for uh, to fix all the NVIDIA support for AMD 64 and to improve it on the i386 side. So you can see uh, that's Alan Cox. Fixed a few of them. This is the big one here. The MMAP implementation, that's the one we really need to get AMD 64 out and to give us the huge boost in performance. We had an intern this last summer, this may be of interest to somebody here, who worked on the VMAP-like interface for the kernel and wrote some patches which are in our uh, subversion repository, but nobody's committed them yet. We just need somebody to look, clean them up, determine that they're okay, and, and throw them in. I've run and built with systems running it, so it doesn't cause any problems that I can detect, but again, I need a kernel developer or somebody to look at it and really um, you know, give it a run through and make sure it's good to go. But uh, once that's done, that's, that's it. Uh, these three things here, already implemented. And there's a whole list here with backlinks and information. I mean, the NVIDIA guys wrote a great like eight-page document on here's what we need in FreeBSD, here's why we need it, here's how it has to be implemented, and then we'll be happy to support you. So, But aside from that, the AMD, port, AMD 64 port runs great. I mean, it looks pretty much identical to this. Yeah, if you want to bookmark that address, or you can just pull it up on the wiki.freebsd.org site. It's right on the main page there, I think down near the bottom. So. There you go. Anybody else still writing that address down, or can I close this up? All right. Good deal. Well, thank you guys very much. I know lunch is in about five minutes, so you guys are welcome to go grab some. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, guys.